across the fence were taking flight to learn about the behavior of crows in the cold weather months. And we'll meet two Vermont food entrepreneurs making maple sriracha. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The common crow is seen and heard throughout our region. The birds are known to be extremely intelligent and very social. The male and female stay with the same mate year after year, but they forage in large groups known as murders. Like many bird species, they also roost in large numbers to sleep, especially in the cold weather. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin spoke with Mark Labar of Audubon, Vermont, to learn more about the American crow. Crows are fascinating, and it seems like, especially in the winter, their behavior is a little bit different. Tell me a little bit about them in general. Well, crows are, are very uh, intelligent birds. They're in the corvid family, so they're in there with ravens and blue jays. In the wintertime, they use a strategy of roosting in, in large numbers. Sometimes uh, they can be in the thousands, um, where they'll all collectively hang together. Uh, they're very social by nature, so you can often see them right at the end of the day migrating or moving towards, I guess would be, to their communal roost sites. Uh, oftentimes these can be in a city or close to the city. Uh, crows like uh, um, an open habitat, so lots of ag land. You usually don't find crows in uh, the forest, so to speak, you know, when you have straight up woods, because they like to use those fields for feeding. And oftentimes you find them in urban settings uh, because the light uh, from the uh, from the buildings and, and just the city protects them a little bit because uh, their predators, uh, great horned owls, will uh, not come into the city when it's lit like that. How is their behavior different in the winter than it would be at other times of the year? Well, as they start to progress and as you get towards the breeding season, uh, those big roosts will begin to break up. But again, because crows are um, very social creatures, they will often move in family groups. You will have younger birds, so birds that hatched and survived uh, you know, from the previous year or two, will often help their the adults in raising the next brood. So you can have uh, groups of crows that you know, they'll set up a nest spot and then a number of different crows moving back and forth to, to feed the young. And what do they eat in the winter? Uh, you know, they're pretty om omnivorous. You know, they'll eat a little bit of everything. Um, you know, if there's snow cover, they might be forced to, to try to find uh, some carrion that's already been, you know, that's around, so something that might be dead. Um, but as soon as the ground cover opens up, you know, worms and insects, uh, sometimes bird eggs, uh, you know, they're very advantageous. Uh, they'll visit um, dumps. Uh, agricultural fields, you can often see them uh, moving through as folks, you know, they plow the fields or uh, they're doing some planting. Um, somewhat notorious in that they'll actually pull up some of the seedlings, so they don't necessarily have a great reputation amongst the farmers, but a little bit of everything. If somebody wanted to observe crows, where would they go? It's interesting because crows seem to be a bird that you, you, know, you find pretty regularly. I, often I can look out the window and I can see crows. But if you talk to a, a crow hunter, you know, they can be actually very difficult to, to track down. Uh, again, agricultural fields, uh, areas that have some degree of openness. If you do know where a, a, a roost is, like a winter roost, uh, you can visit that site too and be pretty much guaranteed that you'll be seeing the birds come in in the evening. How do they communicate with each other? They have a lot of different sounds. Everybody knows the caw, caw, caw of the crow, uh, but there's lots of different vocalizations that they'll use as well. So, a pretty vast repertoire. What are they trying to say to each other? You know, a lot of bird communication is, is just that, especially with a social creature such as the crows. So these different sounds that they make uh, are often just individual birds uh, staying in touch with uh, other uh, crows. And so we know that some birds uh, like to sing in the springtime when it's breeding time and in the summer. Um, but crow communication is, is a little bit more guttural and, you know, these birds, uh, you know, they're just keeping in touch with their neighbors. From late March through mid-April, pairs of male and female crows work together to make a nest. The female will generally lay three to eight eggs, and both sexes will share the 18-day incubation period. Their young chicks will learn to fly by the end of June.
Our next segment has roots in Thailand, but is now made in Vermont. Sriracha is a traditional hot sauce from Thailand. Two Vermont food entrepreneurs have developed a Vermont-specific sriracha sauce. It's called Vermont Maple Sriracha, which of course includes pure Vermont maple syrup, along with the traditional sriracha ingredients, such as peppers and garlic. Keith Silva tells us more about the Vermont version and the two men behind it. From chips to dips, and from soup to nuts, sriracha is hot. Sriracha has become sort of this mainstream style of hot sauce. It's almost like the new ketchup. And in some cases, it is ketchup. Sriracha is made from chili peppers, garlic, vinegar, sugar, and salt. Its popularity in the U.S. is due to David Tran, the founder of Hue Fong Foods. Tran, a Vietnamese immigrant, developed what's commonly called rooster sauce, the first name in stateside sriracha. Lower those down a foot. Yeah. Jackson Whalen and his business partner, Lenny, Big Lenny, Montori, run Vermont Maple Sriracha in Rutland. As the company's name states, it's a very Vermont take on the ubiquitous sauce. Our hot sauce isn't that spicy by hot sauce standards. Um, you know, you're not going to regret it a day later if you have Vermont maple sriracha. Um, and every bottle is unique because every harvest of peppers is different. So we might get a batch of jalapenos that's slightly hotter than the last one, but because we don't add anything like xanthan gum or any of these thickeners or water to it, we can't adjust the heat. So the heat is what it is. It's relatively consistent, but we have had batches at a certain point in the season where the peppers just happen to be hotter. It took Whalen and Montori seven tries before they got the recipe to their liking. It's personal preference that guides their business decisions, for better or for worse. Everything we do here is how would we do it if we did it for ourselves? So when we first started making sriracha, we would buy these uh, bushels of peppers. And, you know, after a pepper gets picked, the first thing that doesn't look good on it is the stem. It starts to dry out. So traditionally, you know, if you're manufacturing hot sauce at scale, you clean everything, but you throw the stems in with it, you grind it up, it becomes part of the sauce. When we were making this, you know, 10 gallons at a time on Lenny's stove, we cut every stem off because that's the way we wanted it because we were going to eat it ourselves. So the same reason, that's why we kept the recipe simple, because we make it like we'd make it for ourselves. Now in terms of you know, economics and profitability, that's kind of coming around to bite us, but we keep reminding ourselves that the reason that people like it so much is because we did take the time to cut the stems off. We did take the time to figure out how to make this natural sauce, preserve it naturally, and not put artificial ingredients into it. If it's not something we would do for ourselves, then we don't do it. So that's sort of the guiding principle of everything we make here. The production of Vermont Maple Sriracha has gone from being made on Big Lenny's stovetop to a nearby commercial kitchen. Here at the Vermont Farmers Food Center, west of downtown Rutland, Whelan and Montori have built a facility to process sriracha-flavored cashews, what they call sriracha shoes. Expansion was another decision that wasn't in the business plan or done by the book. What business plan? <laughs> I mean, uh, this is, uh, it's really entrepreneurship by gut. Everything we've done here, we've been told was not possible and that we shouldn't try and do. So if we had paid attention to all the business books and business planning advice that we've gotten, you and I wouldn't be standing here and we wouldn't be making sriracha shoes because we wouldn't have been able to take control over it. Um, so we've kind of had to throw a lot of that out the window. And um, specialty foods are a particularly brutal, low margin business to begin with, so you have to have a little blind ambition, you know. At $10.99 a bottle, consumers have to show a little blind faith as well. Whelan says customers tell him it's worth every penny. Yes, our hot sauce is expensive compared to other hot sauces produced at a giant massive scale. But I think the people that appreciate it um, value what we put into it and are willing to keep supporting us. So we've been really encouraged that things have continued to grow. We haven't had any artificial spikes where we've crashed really hard. That's an excellent question. Why do we keep doing this? And it really is uh, motivated by the response we get from the people who are eating it. 
If there's one thing to say about Vermont maple sriracha, it's not too hot, but it sure is getting hotter. In Rutland, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thank you, Keith. The University of Vermont now has a permanent display that showcases the university's most accomplished faculty. Located in UVM's historic Waterman Building, the display highlights faculty who've been named distinguished professors. It also recognizes endowed professorships and faculty members who have earned UVM's annual Top Teaching Award. The display was conceived and created by a UVM associate provost who spoke with Across the Fences Rebecca Gollin about the contributions and commitment of UVM. UVM's most accomplished faculty. There's a new permanent display. What is it? It's a display that uh, celebrates and commemorates the accomplishments of our outstanding faculty. Um, and this is something that UVM has been doing for a very long time, recognizing the work of its scholars. Uh, and what we decided to do was to memorialize that in one location. So in the display, what you will see is the university distinguished professors that's a, um, an award that was created in 2009 by uh, former Provost John Hughes. And it's the highest recognition uh, given upon the faculty at UVM. You can also see in the display the names of uh, our Krebs Maurice Award winners, and these are the uh, teaching awards to our most outstanding teachers and, and pedagogical scholars. Uh, and the other part of the display are the faculty who hold endowed professorships and chairs. So these are name awards after some benefactor that recognizes uh, faculty for their outstanding scholarship work as well as their teaching. And where is the display located? It's located on the third floor of the Waterman Building, which is the main floor of the main building on campus. And we did that on purpose because that's perhaps the most trafficked area on the whole campus. Both our visitors and our students um, walk through by every day. Who is in this exhibit? What are some of the examples of some of the names that we would say? The uh, exhibit um, memorializes our accomplished faculty, and we have a lot of accomplished faculty, so there's a lot of names on that board. But the most prominent group are the University of Distinguished Professors. That's uh, um, by design that uh, recognition can only be granted to 10 faculty at any particular time. One example will be um, Wolfgang Meter, who's faculty member at UVM since 1971. So if, if my math is correct, he's been here 45 years. And uh, Wolfgang has, uh, was chair of the German and Russian department, 31 of those 45 years. Uh, he is the uh, world authority on proverbs. Uh, he's recognized worldwide. Um, He's uh, published uh, hundreds of books and hundreds of scholarly articles on proverbs. One of the names on that board may be familiar to the viewers of Across the Fence, and that's uh, Professor Judy Van Houten. Uh, you may recognize her name because she is the director of the statewide EBSCO program, uh, which is featured in Across the Fence, um, and also the director of the uh, Vermont Genetics Network, which is another statewide program. Uh, Professor Van Houten is a recognized scholar in the area of chemoreception. That is how organisms and cells uh, sense chemicals in the outside world and how they process that information. Um, and she's one of our most distinguished scholars. She has been at UVM since 1980 and uh, accomplished quite a bit. You played a key role in creating this exhibit. Why was this important to you? It is important to me because in the world of academia, uh, one of the greatest satisfaction that a, 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 a scholar can get is to, to be recognized by his or her peers. Um, and this is the way that UVM recognizes our, our distinguished faculty and let them know that we really appreciate uh, what they do for the institution, in their profession, and for the, the, the academic work, world at large. That display is open to the public during normal business hours at the Waterman Building. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.